All right, well, before I get to my message, I have just a, a little bit of an exhortation for you. If you're wondering what that is, uh, it, it's just simply, a, it's, it's, a, it's like a, a strong appeal to you. I'd love for you to, to receive this if you can. Um, but I know over the last couple of weeks, there's been all kinds of challenges that we've faced as a nation. We look around, we see the news, we have all of these images, and, and some of us are sad, and some of us are upset, and some of us are confused and conflicted as to know what to do or what to say. Can you relate? And so what I wanted to do for just a moment is share just a word that I feel like is important for us to hear right now as a church. Um, I think it's important for believers to hear. It's simply this, is that when we don't know what to do, Jesus gives us instructions on what to do. Isn't that good news? When you don't know what to say, when you don't know how to act, Jesus gives us instruction. Matter of fact, the disciples came to Jesus one day and said, Jesus, we don't know how to pray. We don't know how to, 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 to seek you in this situation. And, and, and Jesus says in a very simple way, well, let me teach you. And I don't know if you know this prayer, but perhaps you've heard it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? And then there's this little part in there that says, your will be done. Your kingdom come. See, I think one of the most important prayers we can pray in our life is that prayer of surrender. That we surrender our agenda. We surrender our feelings. We surrender everything that we think it should be. Come on. And we just simply pray, God, your will be done. Because God is on the move. God is always working behind the scenes. And matter of fact, you've heard me say this before. If we knew how faithfully God was working behind the scenes, we'd have more peace. Guys, that's the prayer we need to be praying. I wanted to read something that my pastor wrote that I think is pertinent. And he said this could be an add-on to that prayer. And I thought it was really good. He said this, Lord, create in our nation the most optimum environment to usher in revival to your church and awakening to your people in America. See, that's a little different prayer, isn't it? Oftentimes we're praying prayers of comfort or prayers of our own opinion or prayers of what we want. But the thing I know about God is he's always up to something. Even in the struggle, even in the challenge, even in the difficulties, even in the places that we don't feel like anything's happening or God is not listening. The Bible's clear that he is and the Bible's clear that he's working. And so may we pray a prayer that's a little dangerous in some ways. May we pray a prayer for revival. May we pray a prayer that the eyes and the ears all would be open to the kingdom of God and the gospel. We spend so much time on nation building and we forget that we're kingdom builders as believers. And so may you receive this if you would like. But if you do, I promise you it'll bring you hope and it'll bring you peace and it'll help you navigate these coming years. Because God is still on the throne. Jesus is still king. And he's coming back, I'm telling you. And these may be the beginning of the birth pains, but he's coming. Let me pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for your presence among us. I thank you for your word. I thank you for that prayer you taught us, that simple prayer. And so, Lord, we pray that prayer right now as a point of surrender. Lord, your will be done. Your kingdom come. That's what we need. And so, Father, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us how we've harmed each other with our words and help us to be kingdom people. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, I want to continue our series. Thank you, Matt. I want to continue our series today called The Pursuit of Presence. Now, if you've missed any of these, they're available to you online. Uh, and so please go back and look at those. I'll give you a short little recap so I can catch you up. But, but I, I, this, um, this series is something that I believe we all need. 
I think we all need more of God's presence. I think we all need to be a little more committed to pursuing his presence. And so that's what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. And I want to start with our series verse. I shared it a little bit last time, but this is in Psalm 84. I encourage you to read Psalm 84. Matter of fact, add it to your devotional time and just kind of read through Psalm 84 as we go through this series. But Psalm 84, 7 in the Amplified says this. They go from, say this with me, strength to strength. Now, that is an important phrase. They go from strength to strength, and then the Amplified adds this, increasing in victorious power. Woo! Who doesn't want some of that? It says that each of them will appear before God in Zion. So in other words, there's a journey. There's a pilgrimage that's occurring. And that's what this psalm is. It's it's this pilgrimage kind of uh, experience for a Jewish man who was called to go to the to temple every year of his life. And as he walked up this hill, because Jerusalem sits on a hill, he's walking towards Jerusalem. And the Bible says that, that as they go to be in the presence of God, they experience a strength to strength existence. Man, I need some of that. I need some of that in my life. Can you imagine for a moment, always and ever increasing in victorious power, even in the most difficult, darkest days that you could experience strength to strength living, always increasing, ever increasing in victorious power. Man, I need some of that. I suspect you do as well if you're honest. We all need it, and we all want it. Here's the problem, though, that I've discovered, is that sometimes we're not willing to do the things we need to do to get it. You know what I mean? We just kind of want it to show up in our email. Wouldn't that be nice? I want those 20 pounds to just suddenly vanish. Come on. I want that book to just magically be in my brain without reading it. This is by osmosis, you know what I mean? I want those kinds of things, but you've lived long enough to know that's just not how it works. And so there's this element of God's presence and our responsibility within that. And and I want to talk a little bit about that because I think it's so important that we get this, that there is a constant flow of God's presence that gives us access to an always ever increasing victorious power that many of us may not be experiencing right now, if we're honest. And so the first week of the series, we talked about getting headed in the right direction. See, we got to be headed towards God, not away from God. And so we talked about where are you headed? What, What are your steps right now? What are you moving towards? It's the principle of the path. You know what I mean? If you're on that path, eventually you'll end up in that place. And so, so where are we? Where are we moving? Are we moving towards God or away from God? And then Pastor Gretchen, my wonderful wife, last week talked about how important obedience is to experiencing God's power and God's presence. That there's this element of obedience that really comes into play. And we'll talk a lot about that through this series Because it's so essential to us experiencing the strength to strength life. Now, I want to share with you a word that you may or may not have ever heard. It's kind of a funny word. It's kind of a weird word. Uh, And and, and so if you've never heard it, that's okay. It's a matter of fact, it's the title of this message. Uh, But here's the word, Shekinah. Now, have you ever heard that word, Shekinah? The title of the message is Shekinah what? Because most people don't know this word. Now, matter of fact, it's not even in the Bible necessarily, the word itself. It's really an extra biblical word or an extra biblical expression. And so what they did, the the, the rabbis at the time, they, they grabbed a few Hebrew words and put them together. And that's where we get this word Shekinah. But Shekinah just simply means he caused to dwell. He caused to dwell. Now, what does that mean? In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a divine visitation. Get this. The Shekinah is a divine visitation, a dwelling of the Lord God on 
earth. And you're like, well, help me understand that a little bit better. Perhaps you know the story of Israel as slaves in Egypt. Maybe you've seen the movie. But Israel was in slavery in Egypt and God heard their prayers and he led them out of that slavery into the desert. And while they were in the desert, God showed up and he showed up in the form of a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. Now, I I don't know. That's kind of weird, right? But that's what he did. And so there was a constant reminder to the people of Israel that God was with them. That there was this cloud that guided them by day. And there was this fire that guided them by night. I think that would have been cool. Wouldn't you have liked to have seen that? And so, so, so we see this. And, and, and the point I'm trying to make is that is what the Shekinah is. That it's this divine presence of God dwelling among us that we can actually see, that we can actually experience. Oh, I would love to have that. Wouldn't you? Now, I don't know if you have it or not. But here's the thing. The Bible says you can. The Bible says you can experience that kind of presence in your life. See, God has revealed himself in a variety of ways. But what I've found sometimes is that Christians, they like this form of his presence, but they're not so sure about this one or this one, whatever that is. And that's what I want to talk about, because there are very specific ways that God has revealed himself that is available to each one of us if we would simply look around, if we would simply begin to do the things he's called us to do. And so what I want to do for just a moment is I want to lay down three truths about God that are absolutely essential for you understanding and experiencing the presence of God. The first is that we need to understand that God is everywhere. Did you know that? God's everywhere. Listen to this in Psalm 139, 7 through 10. I love this. He says, I can never escape from the Spirit. I can never Get away from his presence. Did you know it? If I go up to heaven, you were there. If I go down to the grave, you were there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the farthest oceans, even even there your hand guides me and your strength will support me. I can't go anywhere without this God being there. He's everywhere. See, God is everywhere. Everywhere. Matter of fact, this is a, a fancy way that theologians refer to God is everywhere. It's, it's a word that perhaps you've heard. It, it's simply this, omnipresent. That God is omnipresent. The word omni just simply means all. So in other words, God is all present. Everywhere he goes, he's there. <laughs> Everywhere you go, he's there. See, God is present in our life at all times, no matter what. There is nowhere in this world that you can go that God is not. God is at your work. God is at that meeting. God is in that relationship. God is in that friendship. God is all over the place. There's nowhere we can go. And isn't it true that sometimes we try to hide? Like it's like, oh, God doesn't see me. But he does. He sees everything. And for some of us, that's a little scary. It's a little scary to think about that God sees everything, like everything. Yeah. Some of us are like, oh, gosh. Right. But see, the Bible says that he sees and knows he's everywhere. We should take comfort in that and not be afraid of it. And the reason is, is because we need his presence. Like, like that's what we need. And so the Bible is very clear, especially as we read Psalm 139, that that he's everywhere. He doesn't, he's not not there. He's over here. He's there. He's there. He's he's everywhere. He is present. There's nowhere that we can go that God isn't. Matter of fact, Jeremiah 23, 24 says it this way. Jeremiah, the prophet says, can anyone hide from me in a secret place? The, The answer is no. If you're wondering. And and he goes on, he says, am I not everywhere in all of heaven and earth, says the Lord? 
So in other words, God is in the secret places. God is in the heavens. God is in the earth. These are true statements. But here's the thing I've been pondering. This was something I've just been wrestling with, been thinking about a lot lately. Here's the question I have. Listen, how can God's presence then be depleted in my life if God is everywhere? Think about that. How is it that God's presence can somehow be depleted in my life if he's everywhere? In other words, if I can experience a strength-to-strength life, then that means that the opposite is true. That I can also experience a weak-and-weak life, a weak-to-weak life. You know, and some of us have experienced strength, and now we're in the weak, and some of us have experienced the weak, and now we're in the strength. But but the Bible presents to us a strength-to-strength life. That's, That's what we're looking at today. And so what that means is is that there is a possibility that I can live depleted in the presence of God. That should scare us a little bit. That somehow, in the middle of God's omnipresence, I can live without the presence of God. Now, Now, what am I saying? See, that's why we have to understand the presence. There's an omnipresence. In other words, God is everywhere. But there's two other forms of presence that I want you to see. And this is where it really, this is where we really dig in. Because some of you are like, yeah, I've heard all that stuff. I've heard all that omnipresent stuff. I got it. I I did theological training. I went to confirmation. But there's two other things, two other things that we've got to see. The second truth about God that I think all of us got to see is that God indwells us. So in other words, his inner presence. You may not even know that. You may not know that God dwells inside of you. See, the Bible says if you put your faith and trust in Jesus for for your salvation, that, that Jesus comes and lives inside of you in the form of the Holy Spirit. In other words, God's presence inside you. Wow. That's pretty remarkable if you think about it. Matter of fact, listen to this in Acts 17, 24. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Then he says, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. Now, if you were a Jew at one time in history, you would have absolutely said that God lives in that temple because that's where God dwelt. But God had a plan and his plan was bigger than that temple. His plan was bigger than brick and mortar. And so what happens is that Jesus comes into the world and as a result of it, if you accept him, that same God, not only lives in a temple, he now transcends the temple because the temple is now you. You're the house and God dwells in you. Do you understand? That's why the inner presence is so important for us to see. And we will never have that inner presence if we don't have Jesus. You must have a relationship with Jesus to have that in your life. And sometimes what happens is we believe in God's presence like he's everywhere. But we haven't quite taken the step to the inner place. To where we actually have surrendered our life to a savior that loves us. So that the inner presence of God can fill us. I love how John says it in the gospel of John chapter 14 verse 23 through 24. Jesus replied, he says, all who love me will do what I say. There's that obedience stuff again. He's saying, if you love me, you'll do this stuff. My father will love them and he will come and make. No, we will come and make our home with each of them. So so what he's saying is that if you love God and part of loving God is believing in him. He will come and live inside of you. That's pretty powerful to think about. That he will come and make his home inside of you. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. He's like, I'm not saying this stuff because they're just mine. I'm telling you what the Father is saying. And he says, what I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. And so so very clearly, the Bible is telling us that the, the Spirit of God, the presence of God, lives inside of us. Listen to how 1 John writes it. 1 John 14 through 13, 4, sorry, 1 John 4, 13. 
And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. In other words, if the spirit of God is living in you and you know that, then that means it's proof that God is in you. 1 Corinthians 3.16, this is really good. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God? Do you see it? And the spirit of God lives in you. So in other words, there's the omnipresent, God's everywhere, but there's an inner presence that comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ that is available to you right now, every moment of your life, no matter where you go, it's portable. Get that. It's not stuck in here. Like sometimes we think when we go to church, that's where the presence of God is. Well, yeah, hopefully. And the reason we say hopefully is because the presence of God is in the people. And if the people have the presence of God, then the presence of God is in the house. Yeah. That's what the Bible teaches. And so we have to understand that that's available. to Here's the third thing I want you to see. And this is really where we're getting. So we're going broad. And now we're getting more specific. You with me? And so God is everywhere. God dwells inside of us through our relationship with Jesus Christ. And number three, and this is where it gets really good. This is the third truth that you need to know about God, and that is God is clear and convincingly observable in the world. God is clear and convincingly observable in the world. Now, for all the scientists in the room, that means it's empirical. Now, that's hard for some of us because you're like, wait a second, faith is not empirical. Well, do you believe that God reveals himself to his people? And if you believe that, then it has to be clear. It has to be convincing. It has to be observable. And if it was true in the Old Testament that we see those things, why would it not be true today? Isn't it the same God? Isn't it the same God that we worship? Of course it is. And so this idea that somehow it stopped or it's no longer available to us, that's just hogwash. Because the Bible says very clearly that you can experience God's presence in a clear and convincingly observable way. Wow. You know what? The, the, that's where the Shekinah comes in, guys. That's where the Shekinah comes in. In other words, say this word with me. Manifest presence. Ready? Manifest presence. In other words, the presence of God is everywhere. The presence of God is inside me. But the presence of God is also manifest in our world. The question is, is are we seeking it? Are we moving towards it? Are we moving towards God in that way? See, God's manifest presence is evident in all of the traces of the divine that are clear, observable in our world. And I am so thankful that that's possible. I just really am. Because that means that I don't have to think about a God that's just transcendent. You know, in the sky by and by. No, no, no. He's also imminent. He's transcendent and imminent. That means he's close. He's revealed in Jesus. He's observable. He, he, he's, he's clear and concise. It's, it's like, whoa, I can have that today, not just later? Yes. So here's the question I have for you. And this is the harder question. Is the manifest presence of God clearly and convincingly manifest in your life right now? Now, I ask that question and some of us say, oh. Because we're like, ah, ah, ah. and I get it. I get it. But my hope and prayer as we come through this series is that there would grow in you a commitment to not only believe that that's possible, but to begin to move towards it, to begin to take steps to experience the manifest presence of God. You don't have to do anything to experience the omnipresence of God. It's already there. You definitely have to accept Jesus to get the inner presence, but you got to put in some work if you want the manifest presence of God. Does that make sense? There is faith. And then there's action, both of which are important to our journey. Now, you can be saved and not experience the manifest presence of God in your life if you don't want to. But here's the question. Why would you want to do that? Why would you do that? Why would you spend the rest of your days not experiencing God's manifest presence in your life? It makes no sense, does it? 
And I know you guys are smart people. Look at you. I'm just so smart. I just see it on your face. Probably most of you can read. I mean, it's, you can do your gazintas. Nobody, that was a Beverly Hillbillies uh, reference. Jethro would do his gazintas. Two goes into gazinta four two times. Come on, guys. I'm older than I look. <laughs> do your gazintas. Jethro, go to Cyphering. <laughs> oh, sorry. I got a little distracted. But who among us doesn't want that? And I know you do. I know each one of you want it. Because you wouldn't be here if you didn't. The question is, what are we going to do to get it? What are we going to do to get it? And that's what I want to talk about over the next few weeks is how do we get that in our life? I want to share something with you from Acts chapter 2. If you know the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2 is where Pentecost begins to happen. If you don't know what that is, it's, it's, it's where the Holy Spirit comes. In other words, Jesus has gone away to be with the Father, who he, now he sits at the right hand of the Father on a throne, waiting to come back in final victory. And in the process of all that, he sends his Holy Spirit to be with us now so that we can have his very presence among us. And so the Holy Spirit shows up. And this is in Acts chapter 2. And I, as, I, as I read it, I wonder if you can notice the convincing clear ways that God is observable in this experience. Starting in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Verse 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. That's pretty observable. And look at this. And it filled the entire house. So this wind fills the entire house and everybody's like, whoa. They're watching this happen. And here's the thing that you've heard me say so many times, and I'll keep saying it, is that when we make space for God, He always fills it. Did you see it? He filled the entire house. See, when we make space in our house, our hearts, our minds, our time, our relationships, our difficulties, our conflicts, our unforgiveness, our bitterness. When we make space, God says he will fill it. That's good news, friends. And so it says that the Bible says that it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then in verse 3, it says, And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Now you're seeing something. Verse 4, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Guys, that is a manifestation of God's presence among his people. And I wonder if you want that in your life. I wonder, because here's what I know, guys. Everything that God wants to give you is good. We should never be afraid of anything that he wants to give us. We should never be afraid of any aspect of his spirit that kind of makes us uncomfortable. It's not about your comfort. It's about you receiving the fullness of God. And I suspect that when the fullness of God shows up and does some stuff, it might make us a little uncomfortable. And that's what we've got to see. We've got to press in because I want more of God in my life. I want more of his manifest presence in my life. And here's the turning point that I got to get you to see. Here it is. We will not experience the manifest presence of God if we are not willing, listen, to pursue his presence through an absolute commitment to spiritual disciplines and developing holy habits. You're like, oh man. Like, you got to put in some work. And I know, I know that I can stand up here and preach and get excited and frothy-mouthed and, and maybe even inspire you to take a step, but I can't walk for you. I can't crack the book for you. All I can do is point you in the right direction and say, take that step. And guys, some of us, 
are not taking the step. And here's the thing. I don't want you to feel guilty. I don't want you to feel condemned. Matter of fact, if you feel condemned, that's not from God. That's from your enemy. But if you feel a little conviction, that's the Holy Spirit. And if you'll repent of your ways and tell God you're going in a new direction and ask the Holy Spirit to come into that, He will do it. And all the things that you want in terms of manifestations of God's presence will start to come to pass in your life if you will commit yourself to it. I heard this quote this week that I thought was so powerful and I wanted to share it with you. It's from Pastor Mark Patterson, who pastors for the last four presidents in Washington, D.C. And he was talking about the challenges that we're facing. And he said this, he said, the only, listen, listen, the only ceiling on our intimacy with God and impact on the world is daily spiritual disciplines. The only ceiling on your life. The only ceiling on your life is whether or not you're willing to cultivate these disciplines. Your impact on the world, the vision and the dream that God has put in your heart, all of those things come to pass when we finally figure this out. That God is everywhere. If you know Jesus, He's in you. But if you want the manifestation of His presence in your life, then you got to get to work. Because the only ceiling you have is the fact that you're not doing it. Whew. Come on, preacher. That's so good. Uh. <laughs> well, as we end, I, I, I was, um, I bought something off of eBay the other day. No, not eBay. Amazon. I bought something off Amazon the other day. Uh, and I, I was surprised they had it on Amazon, but it was a presence meter. You ever seen one of these? I'm kidding, guys. Amazon didn't have no presence meter. You're like, they have time machines? Yeah, yeah. But wouldn't it be cool if you could buy a presence meter? Wouldn't that be neat? Like, you know, like you take your blood pressure and all that, you put, put the little thing on your arm, and it tells you what's going on. Wouldn't that be cool if you had a presence meter? And so what I want to do for just a second is ask you a couple of questions. Maybe I'll be your presence meter. Here's the question. They're very simple questions. How are your dailies? How are your dailies? In other words, what does it look like daily for you to connect with God's manifest presence? You know, are you reading? Are you praying? Are you cracking the book? I mean, any of that going on? If it's not, God is gently through the Holy Spirit right now bringing conviction into your life so that you'll repent and do something different. How about this? How are your weeklies? How are your weeklies? You know, are you connecting in community? Are you connecting in accountability with somebody? Are you connecting in the church to come to worship? I mean, the data seems to indicate that that's not happening, but you know, that's another day. See my point? How are your weeklies? And then finally, how are your quarterlies? How are your quarterlies? If you're wondering what that means, is like, that's what it means. You need to get away quarterly for at least a day or maybe even two to simply be with God. The, the, the old monks of the past knew how important silence and solitude was to our life. And in a world that is just talking all the time, you need some silence and solitude to hear God. I'm just telling you. And I know that's uncomfortable. And you're like, yeah, I can't do that one. Fine. Start somewhere else then. But look, if you were to add or subtract some things, maybe one daily, one weekly, and one quarterly, just do one of those things, you know, in each area, I promise you, God is not a liar. I promise you, He will show up if you'll create the space and you will begin to experience the manifest presence of God in your life. And no, oh, it's not going to be good for you. And then this church is going to be full of his presence. And, and then the city is going to be full of his presence. And then this world is going to be full of his presence. And when everybody doesn't know what to do, the church will. Because we've spent enough time with God to know exactly what he's doing. All right, so next week, listen, listen, listen. Next week, I'm going so practical on you, you won't even be able to see straight. 
My message is 10 ways that you can experience the manifest presence of God in your life. You don't want to miss that because God wants to meet you. And so I'm really excited about sharing that with you next week. But I want us to continue to press in so that as we come out of this series, man, we're going to be so lit on God. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Great for our city. Great for our church. Let me pray for us. Lord, if we're honest, if we're honest, that there have probably been moments or maybe even long seasons this past year that we haven't been pursuing you like we should. And if you would put yourself in that group, <laughs> maybe you haven't been doing your dailies or your weeklies or your quarterlies, you just haven't been doing it. And you're feeling it, like you're feeling it. You're barely hanging on in some ways. I wanna pray for you because I believe that you wanna get better. I believe that you have faith to move towards a God that loves you, to move towards a God that has the power that you need. And so I wanna pray for you. If that's just you, just pray this prayer with me in your heart. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I've made it. <laughs> I ask your forgiveness. I repent. I confess to you my sin my laziness, my apathy, my comfort. I just confess those things to you and I say, God, I'm sorry. But Lord, I know I can't do it without you. And I want so much to experience your manifest presence in my life. And, and so Lord, would you help me? Holy Spirit, would you come and fill me again? And I commit to you today, Lord, that I'm going to add one daily. I'm going to add a weekly. And I'm going to add a quarterly. And this year, I am going to seek you with everything I've got. I reject a depleted experience of your presence. And I embrace strength to strength. You know, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I, I do want to ask a question. Earlier in the message, I talked about the inner presence of God. And I talked about that that only comes to be in our lives when we finally give our faith and put our faith and trust in God that Jesus is who he says he is. And I just want to share the gospel with you really quick. If you don't know what that is, it's, it's this in a nutshell. That Jesus was born as the Son of God. He lived he died a brutal death. Three days later, he was resurrected. And the Bible tells us that he promises to come back again. My friends, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that can be your story if you want it. In order to have the inner presence of God, you need to have God. And Jesus is that. And so if you're willing to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and faith that these things are true, God says that he will come in and dwell in you. He loves you that much. And so if you would like to say a prayer that would lead you in that way, that you'd like to enter into a relationship with Jesus today, I want to I offer this prayer for you. I just encourage you to, to say it after me. It's, there's nothing magical about it. It's just, it's just a prayer that, that if you mean it, it will be true. And so church, let's all pray together. Nobody's praying alone in here. But if this is your heart, if this is what you want, you pray this prayer with us. Heavenly Father, I need you. Would you forgive me of my sins? Jesus, would you be my Savior? Will you be my Lord? I surrender everything to you. Lord, would you fill me with your presence? I commit this day. To serve you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Can we celebrate those that are making decisions today?